are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. This is Sean Nelson with the Virginia, D.C. HFMA chapter. I'd like to thank you all for joining us this morning. We welcome you. Since this is our third week, I'm assuming everyone knows Christoph at this point, so I'm not going to spend much time doing an introduction for him. But thank you, Christoph, for taking your time to help us with our certification practicum. I uh, do have a few housekeeping items I'd like to go over with you this morning. Um, today we're going to mostly focus on revenue cycle. If you'd like CPE credits for today, you need to respond to at least two-thirds of the polling questions that will be given throughout the webinar. You do not have to provide a correct answer to receive credit, but you must um, respond. You also have to be connected to the webinar for at least 90% of the running time. A recording of this week's webinar should be posted by end of business tomorrow with answers to all the polling questions and any additional materials that Christoph may provide. All of these items can be found at tnhfma.org slash chfp hyphen webinars. And any questions that you have for Christoph today, please ask those through the questions box in GoToWebinar. Again, any of your questions, please ask through the questions box and go to webinar. Um, again, just make sure you respond to those polling questions and stay attached for 90% of the time to get your CPE credit. And with that, Christoph, I think I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, welcome to this third in our webinars. Um, I am happy to be with you. Uh, again today and our topic is the revenue cycle. I want to do uh, several things though to bring us back to some of the things we've already talked about. I'm going to start with uh, something from last week from our cost volume profit um, conversation which uh, I'm not sure one can enjoy talking about something so dry, but I had an opportunity this week to use this very um, tool and I'm going to show you what I did with it. Uh, hopefully this will be something that uh, um, will inspire you to use this break-even tool uh, yourself. I was asked, I'm the interim CFO right now at a hospital in Arizona, and uh, I was asked by the um, uh, one of the department managers uh, uh, um, to help her pencil out the economics of starting a pulmonary rehab program. She had done a wonderful PowerPoint presentation on the benefits of such a program, but she wanted some help in figuring out the, the, the financial feasibility. So I said, I need from you uh, uh, some information. I, first of all, I need to know what your fixed costs are. So she gave me a list of the equipment she needs, and uh, we're including in there a week's worth of training uh, as an upfront fixed cost. And then I said, what are your variable costs going to be? And she said, well, I'm going to uh, have a $22 hour staff, do this for uh, at most eight hours a week. So I looked at the financial statements to see what the benefit load factor was and then I asked her how what is your labor standard for this procedure she says well it's about an one hour uh, rehab session and a therapist can do up to six patients at the same time uh, so that was useful to know and then I wanted to know what uh, we should charge for that and I kind of uh, figured that one out myself by taking our highest uh, uh, reimbursement and then adding some money to it and this is for a particular G code uh, and she had given me this G code so I knew that and then I took um, then I figured out what some of the other uh, uh, reimbursement rates would be this is a critical access hospital so I knew the percentage of um, uh, um, that of our charges that uh, uh, Medicare would reimburse. I knew that Medicaid would pay nothing and I just simply estimated that uh, all the other payers would pay about $140 although I have really no evidence uh, uh, to doing this uh, with the, in the short time that I had and then I applied the estimated payer mix uh, to 
this data and I determined what I thought a blended uh, reimbursement rate would be, a weighted average reimbursement rate, simply taking the reimbursement amounts uh, times the estimated uh, uh, payer mix and then uh, adding them together. And so I figured that the blended reimbursement rate would be about $92 per um, hour of uh, pulmonary re rehab. And then I determined what my contribution margin is. I'm assuming right now that uh, uh, the labor costs are all of the variable costs that I have an hour's worth of labor an hour, and here's one uh, a unit of reimbursement that gives me a contribution margin of $65 and it allowed me to calculate a contribution margin uh, ratio and to help the manager out I, I told her what this means it's the percentage of each dollar of net revenue that goes to cover fixed costs the percentage of uh, reimbursement that is profit after fixed costs are met kind of trying to make this easy to understand and then I said assumes that the therapist only treats one person per hour and performs other revenue producing work when not providing pulmonary therapy so the therapist isn't going to sit around but be otherwise uh, engaged uh, and then profitability would be higher if therapist treats more than one patient at a time lower if the therapist uh, is idle and then I uh, simply created a formula, a simple formula, you see it up here, uh, and you know what that formula is from our conversation uh, last week. It's fixed costs divided by contribution margin per unit. And uh, that uh, gave me a, uh, a break-even point. So after only 123 procedures, uh, uh, the uh, hospital is going to make money on this. And then I put in a number uh, not knowing and I told the uh, manager in my email she could put her own number in here. However many procedures she thinks she might do, let's say if she thinks she can do 500 procedures a year. Uh, and then you can see what the annual profit is. So it, you see how simple this model is. It, it only works of course for certain things. It's not going to work where you are paid on a whole episode of care, which is increasingly common. But the point is that uh, this uh, cost volume profit uh, methodology lends itself beautifully to figuring out margins on some simple stuff. And, and given that uh, medical imaging, for instance, is a very high profit margin area, uh, I'm using that as an example, that's an area where a model like this may very well work where volume still matters and where cost per unit matters and where contribution margin is a is a useful concept. So that's the first thing I wanted to show you. And then another thing I'm going to have to tell you because I can't show you, unfortunately, I don't have it uh, um, ready to show you. But remember, we talked about ratios in our first webinar. I'm just going to take us back there to an area where we spent quite a bit of time two weeks ago with ratio formulas. Here they start and I suggest that you use the Quizlet uh, app on your um, smartphone to drill these and uh, uh, or otherwise uh, take these pages out of your binder, photocopy them and, and study from them. Well, I also told you that uh, the reason these ratios are in this curriculum is because Bill Cleverly um, is the person who um, uh, put these, assembled these together uh, a generation ago. Now, Bill has not stood still and uh, while I can't show this to you uh, because I don't have a scanned image of it, um, his, uh, he publishes, Cleverly and Associates, publishes a, uh, a book um, called The State of the Hospital Industry. And I happen to have the 2014 edition, the current edition, and I uh, um, looked at it to see, well, what's the state of the art when it comes to ratios? And there are, lo and behold, 89 ratios in there, in, in this book that uh, Bill and uh, his firm apply to uh, ho acute care hospitals and also critical access hospitals. And some of the 
candidates that you see here uh, are, are all still in there, but uh, you also see some things that uh, you haven't seen before. Uh, so I just encourage you to, um, if you are in finance, you might very well already have, have this book, is to get a copy of it and uh, extend your knowledge of ratios uh, forward and take it into some areas uh, that uh, maybe you uh, didn't realize uh, you could do. Now one thing I do want to mention, I, when we talked two weeks ago and I asked uh, uh, what is the most important ratio and I said well operating margin is the most important ratio, it's the performance indicator as the accountants call it, but uh, in looking at uh, uh, Bill Cleverly's book, I, I think I'm going to in the future say it's the return on equity that is uh, more important because that's really, and Bill argues this persuasively in the foreword to his text, is, is really the owner's perspective of the uh, um, capacity of a building and uh, of, of a, uh, an organization. And he thinks that uh, the focus on operating margin has misled hospitals into overbuilding and uh, creating excess capacity if they had watched their return on equity better they wouldn't have done that and they would uh, uh, not find themselves with so much excess capacity now. It's an interesting argument um, and uh, we don't have time here to evaluate it but uh, you know we talked last week about the cost of capital and we tied it to a return on equity so you can see how these topics uh, uh, interrelate and that's I think one of the wonderful things about these webinars and this curriculum and the HFMA the certification process overall that it allows us to connect dots in a way that uh, we didn't know uh, we could do. So what we're going to do today is try to connect some dots with the revenue cycle and there's an awful lot of dots here to connect uh, just at the outset if you are a revenue cycle person and I'm imagining a lot of you are in the in the out there listening you will uh, have find that you're having your comeuppance because you already know a lot of this stuff uh, if you are in finance uh, you probably know a lot about this area either I see from the number of uh, uh, people participating that our attendance today is a little bit lower than it's been in the last two weeks I attribute that to the fact that people think well, we, I already know the revenue cycle, I don't need to listen to a webinar on this. Well, um, you'll see when we come to how this uh, topic is tested that there are actually some uh, topics in here that uh, very few of us really understand well. So let's uh, go and look at the revenue cycle here uh, in terms of an overview first. We're going to do an overview. I'm going to walk us through some case, some case studies and I'm going to rely on you to use the chat area to uh, participate and ask questions and uh, Brad and uh, Sean and Martha will uh, hopefully interrupt me and make sure I ask the questions. Now there was a question last week about cash budgeting and I punted on it. I said I'd need to think about it. I. Uh, um, amended a page to or page 43 in the uh, study guide and uh, that is posted on the Tennessee website uh, with, with the answer to the question about cash budgeting from last week. The revenue cycle is portrayed in the online study material as a, 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 a kind of a, a, a solar system in a way with the revenue cycle in the middle. I'm going to blow this up to make it as big as I can and uh, with all kinds of uh, satellites and uh, planets and uh, pieces of space debris uh, of, um, circling around the revenue cycle. That's perhaps true but not a particularly helpful way in learning the revenue cycle and so what I prefer to do is uh, use the tried and uh, true uh, need to 
adjust this in such a way that you can see what it is I'm doing here. Here we go. I prefer to look at it as this in this pipeline view that uh, you will already be familiar with. Uh, this concept has been around for a long time and the idea here is to think of the revenue cycle as a, a linear process that has a beginning, a middle and an end and there are uh, a number of functions that uh, take place around it uh, along or along it and uh, the uh, goal of course is to collect the best information or accurate information up front so that the processes downstream that depend on these upfront uh, information gathering steps performed accurately can themselves produce cash uh, quickly without denials and without rework. So it's a kind of a factory model where uh, uh, things come together, parts come together, they're assembled and at the end uh, comes out uh, uh, out of this lean machine comes all the cash that an organization is entitled to. Now, um, yes, go ahead. We have a couple folks asking if you could put the PowerPoint into presentation mode. They think it would make it easier for them to view. Happy. How's that? Looks better on my screen. Hopefully. Okay, super. Happy to do that for you. And I, we're not going to stay with this uh, PowerPoint for very long anyhow. And the slides are all in your tab for um, under uh, lecture presentations. So, okay, so we have this pipeline concept. And uh, the question, of course, is what what are you going to label these boxes? First of all, how many boxes are you going to have? What are you going to label them? And then what functions are going to take place in each of these boxes? So a lot of uh, what the exam asks are those kinds of questions, uh, uh, testing you for a general understanding of what uh, occurs in this pipeline and uh, in what order it occurs. So how are we going to skin this thing um, and do this as a uh, as a learning experience. I'm going to take us now to the book itself and uh, the revenue cycle section here in particular. Okay, here's that diagram again. And I want to ask you to turn to page uh, 60. Okay, that's where I am right now. I'm showing you page 60. Okay, so what are we looking at here? This is, uh, these pages come from a an article from the HFMA magazine that is now seven years old, but it isn't in any way or shape dated. David Hammer, a member of the Florida HFMA chapter and a, a well, highly regarded speaker at many chapter events and uh, at national events, um, did his own little field study seven years ago. He's a revenue cycle guy, so he knows this stuff, but he asked his buddies, tell me what uh, a what constitutes superior performance in the revenue cycle, and then he tabulated it and published it. So he has here a list of best practices, and I figured uh, what better information to give you in this text uh, than uh, David's uh, list of best practices uh, that uh, um, really represent, even I think to this day, the state of the art when it comes to revenue cycle performance. Uh, if anything has changed, uh, uh, his uh, benchmark for days uh, revenue in accounts receivable has, uh, is, is higher than the, the state of the art is today as uh, systems have improved our capabilities in getting paid. So in any case, these are his best practices listed and you don't need to memorize a single one of these. They're in your book, number one, as a reference um, for uh, your work in uh, healthcare financial management and secondly, just as a way to appreciate and understand what uh, some of the components of the revenue cycle are. So first of all, he has all of these quantitative benchmarks and there's a lot of them. Then he has a best practices checklist. Uh, these are not 
uh, numeric or quantitative uh, um, best practices, but they are uh, systems or capabilities or qualities or features that a good revenue cycle has in scheduling that, remember, was our first box in the pipeline. Insurance verification is another pre-authorization and pre-registration down here I almost skipped. Patient access registration, uh, financial counseling, these are all the, the boxes uh, uh, we're, we're right here in this top tier right now uh, looking at at David's list and then he goes into HIM then he has charge entry revenue protection which are two of the areas that reside here in the middle right here HIM is down here and then he has uh, uh, billing claim submission um, cashiering refunds third party and guarantor follow-up so uh, it's nice to have this denials are here okay so use this uh, um, and have some fun with this to um, appreciate the uh, complexity of the, fine, uh, the revenue cycle. He has some information about contracting, collection, outsourcing. It's a wonderful, wonderful list. Now what and see physician practice management is in, in here also including what you do about silent PPOs. We'll come back to silent PPOs next week in our last webinar. So that's what he has put together for you here and I'm just passing on this knowledge to you. Um, then what I want to talk to you about is what uh, has since happened in the industry. I'm going to make this uh, uh, bigger again so you can see this better. Okay, I guess I have this. No, I'm going to go back here. Here's the complete diagram. Uh, you may be familiar with the MAP initiative of HFMA. That stands for Measure, Analyze, and, well, geez, what does it stand for? Measure, Apply, Perform. Okay, Measure. Uh, apply perform. So measuring uh, performance, that's something that um, David modeled with his 2007 article, apply evidence-based strategies for improvement and then perform to the highest standards across the board. But that's what the MAP initiative is. It's, it's uh, HFMA's attempt to improve or uh, contribute to the state of the art of the revenue cycle. So HFMA has uh, prepared a map app. It's a piece of software that uh, HFMA leases uh, and if you participate in this map program you um, have to buy or lease the software. You put your receivables, your revenue cycle data into it and it uh, measures uh, you in a rigorous way using uh, a formulas that the industry has since settled on and it allows you to benchmark your performance against other MAP users in, in a way that uh, hopefully is apples to apples. So what HFMA has done to kickstart this thing is they pull together a team of uh, revenue cycle experts a few years ago and they uh, were sat in a room and they were asked to define what uh, good performance is and how do you measure it. So this group of people came up with a, a set of 25 ratios, oh my god, ratios and 11 physician practice management ratios. They're called map keys and uh, you they're in your text as well. You don't need to learn a single one of these really, uh, because I don't think you're going to be asked them after all the racial questions you've already had to endure. But uh, again, they are in the text here to encourage you to measure your revenue cycle performance the same way uh, organizations that participate in the MAP initiative measure them. You don't have to subscribe to this software or anything. You can do this in your own shop. And uh, again, they're in here just to show you what ways there are to measure things, including point of service cash collections as a metric and as a uh, means of setting goals in, say, uh, access uh, 
services department. And there is a, just a little bit of overlap here. And that is that one of the ratios is indeed our uh, day's revenue and receivables. And it's in here someplace under management. Net days in accounts receivable. So that this ratio number 17 is going to, is actually the very same one you saw in the ratio uh, materials in webinar number one. Now, just to um, give you a, a little bit of an inkling as to what things people measure, there is um, uh, uh, something called um, final days, final build not submitted to payer. Actually, that's not the one I wanted to show you one first. I want to show you number seven, okay? Days in total discharge not submitted to payer. This is a, a metric that um, is typically not provided by a patient accounting system. You have to put the pieces together yourself and think about it as a, if you go back to the pipeline view, we're gonna go do that here for a second, go back to our pipeline picture here. Once a patient is discharged, which uh, uh, isn't on a is a box here, but let's say that happens around this bend right here. The patient is discharged. Uh, a number of things still need to happen before uh, the payer actually gets the the claim. Uh, the charges have to be uh, charging has to be completed. That's a charge capture process here, but that's an ongoing process as charges still trickle in. Uh, physicians need to finish their documentation. Um, and uh, coding needs to uh, uh, code the claim. Uh, the claim needs to be scrubbed in the uh, editor. It needs to, and then it goes to the payer. And uh, so the, this crosses the dividing line in most computer systems between unbuild and build. Unbuild uh, could uh, be any that has charges even before they are admitted, uh, like uh, uh, pre-surgery lab charges, as an example. Um, and it could include patients that have been um, uh, discharged, but where the charge process is still going on. And final build then is a process that in the clock of most computer systems starts the moment the bill is generated after HIM says we're done, it's coded, it can now go to billing. But in reality, the dividing line isn't so clear cut. And this um, number seven, this ratio number seven, total discharge not submitted to pay payer, encompasses the entire uh, span of time from the moment of discharge to the moment the claim leaves the the editor, the claim scrubber, and goes to the payer. So think of that as a large chunk of the pipeline that needs to be managed. And it com consists of two particular uh, components. One of them is this one right here, days in total discharge, not final bill. That's the first part of number seven. It's the patients that have been discharged and where a final bill hasn't been cut. In other words, the doctor is still documenting, coding is still coding, etc. And then the second uh, um, component uh, that uh, still needs to occur is this one right here. The days in final bill not submitted to payer. That's where a final bill has been cut. The computer system thinks the bill has been billed. The account has been billed, but not necessarily so because it hasn't gone to the payer. So that's what this statistic or this ratio or this map key number 10 is trying to capture. Okay, so just again, the, remember the idea is to have fun with this and hopefully you will find this useful rather than bewildering. Now, how do you turn all of this into some case studies? And um, the way I do this, uh, we're not going to have time to do this here together. As fun, much fun as it would be, uh, is that I um, um, do, uh, typically when I do this in person, I do this as a, an exercise with all the people in the room. And I tell the audience, the participants, that I'm the CFO 
of HFMA Community Hospital and that I have uh, uh, invited my entire revenue cycle team and that's everyone in the room to uh, help us win a MAP award to become best in class in our revenue cycle over the next couple of years. And so uh, our uh, journey towards that goal starts today with an attempt to uh, lay out what our ideal revenue cycle will look like once we are done with this, uh, uh, with this process. So I have uh, given people um, lots of paper and tape and sticky notes and markers and they are to design today a revenue cycle uh, and then that's the revenue cycle we're going to build together. So how do I do this? How can you accomplish something like this uh, 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 in the context of a, of a certification um, class? So I give people a list of labels and um, the very top level labels are front end, middle and back end because those are, as you remember from our pipeline, the chief uh, uh, components front end and this middle here is called patient care. You can call it something else if you want to in the back end. So you have at least that overall um, uh, schema to organize this information and then I give the participants a list of 36 nouns. They're all listed here in yellow there in your book. I'm going to make them bigger so that you can see them as best as possible. So notice that they're alphabetized. So they're not in process order. They're simply in alphabetical order. Also notice as you look at this list that they are not necessarily uh, uh, mutually exclusive. There is some overlap. There's some um, way in which some of these nouns uh, denote higher level organizing principles than others. And uh, I basically asked the group, okay, choose amongst these 36 uh, the ones that you want to use to label your boxes. How did I come up with this list? Well, uh, I work in the revenue cycle at least part of the time myself. I didn't want to trust my own knowledge here, so I went through a, a number of uh, HFMA magazine articles and uh, uh, extracted from them what seemed to me all of the possible names that one could apply to these high-level boxes. So there's a choice of 36 of those. And then here are 106 verbs that denote detailed revenue cycle processes. Again, these come out of uh, reading HFMA articles. I didn't make any of these up. I just simply uh, uh, extracted them, I abstracted them from the magazine and I put them in uh, alphabetical order which very nicely scrambles these uh, headings and then what I do is and this is bigger than it need to be here then I, uh, I and I can share this with you I will send this to Brad and he will post this on the Tennessee website I basically say now okay folks tell me what you want to how you want to label this thing and I'm gonna just guess here Yes, two was the front end, and I think one is the back end, yes, and so three must be the middle, the middle piece. So I asked them to label the, the three main components of the pipeline, and then, and then this is where the debate starts as to what goes first, and, and not having this in front of me, I'm just going to have to show you if I just put... Uh, numbers in, you see I come up with a, um, a list that doesn't really make sense uh, uh, sequentially, but uh, uh, people can build their own revenue cycle by putting the right labels in here and then having a robust conversation about what should we call that box and maybe we need more boxes. And then the conversation continues as uh, we go through a process of uh, uh, then 
labeling these things. Ah, there it is. You see now um, it pulls in the sections, the 106 uh, labels that start with verbs. Okay, so you can use this in your own organization if you'd like with your own revenue cycle staff to uh, build a revenue cycle. You can use this as a training tool with non-clinical depart with clinical departments, non-financial departments, and uh, just simply uh, uh, or, or make this into some kind of a game or or contest as to uh, building uh, rival models of, of 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 the revenue cycle. So that's one of the ways in which I attempt to um, give you something that will help those of you who really want to learn more about the revenue cycle can learn about it. Then another tool that I have created is uh, is another exercise uh, which goes into um, into more detail and you find that one in the case study section uh, on page 286. So that's where I'm going to maneuver us here. Okay, so here are all of the 25 uh, hospital map keys. Okay, you saw them a moment ago. And then here are, uh, yes, just those. I don't do this for the physician, the other 11 map keys for the physician revenue cycle. And then I give you a whole bunch of data here. This is essentially gross data or uh, uh, unfiltered data, I should say, coming straight out of your patient accounting system or your financial system, stuff that you somehow are able to measure. And then I ask you to use this information to calculate the map keys. And the answer to that is in the back of your book. Uh, about 370 or so, but first of all, I'm going to show you the answer to the uh, process uh, study that we just did, the case study here. So this is a possible way that this uh, case study on the process uh, turns out. And then here is the case study that determined, whoops, so oh, I didn't mean to, whatever I did, I did a backwards flip here. Oh. Yeah, so here are, here's the raw data on the left, and then here are the calculations of the map keys on the right. It's a more complicated exercise. Um, I don't know uh, if, if, if it's helpful. In any case, it's just another way to learn how a revenue cycle functions. Say you are a consultant in the revenue cycle and you sell some kind of a tool, it might be useful for you to do an exercise like this because really you're putting yourself in the shoes of your clients uh, and, and measuring things the way they would measure things. And if you've done this once yourself, I think it will make you more confident uh, in presenting your solution to a client. Okay, so that are, that's the exercises that accompany the process part of the revenue cycle. And now we are going to come to the Medicare piece of the revenue cycle. But before we do that, I want to ask you to do uh, start with one um, of our polling questions. And uh, Brad, are you able to show polling questions in any order? This is Sean, and yes, I am. Sean, would you show uh, polling question number eight, the very last polling question, Sean? Please. There you go. Okay, let me read this. Modifiers are, no, no. Which of the following is true? You can see DNSP, DNFB. FBNS, so you're going to have to remember what I just told you about uh, the initials and uh, how they are grouped together. If you need uh, to know where the definitions of these are, I'm going to provide that with you, for you. 
so you can flip into your back into the text of your book the map keys start on page 67 of your book I'm going to be quiet here for a moment to allow you to work on this without interference from me. We do still have quite a few people who haven't voted, so again, you have to do the polling questions to get the CPE credits. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to help you out. You need to look uh, at the following map keys, uh, map key 6, map key 7, and map key 10 in your book because that's where the the acronym is spelled out for you. Christoph, as people vote, we did get a question come in asking, are these important to the exam? No, I already told you they are not. Um, none of these uh, things are tested with a quantitative uh, example. They are important insofar as they allow you to know the revenue cycle better. I think they belong into everybody's toolkit to know, but they are not tested like ratios uh, uh, where you're given the name of a ratio, you're given a bunch of data and asked to calculate. No. And I'm Looks only like most everyone has voted at this point. Very good. Then 10 seconds. Yep, then close it please Sean and let's see what uh, what the audience said. Yes, A is the right answer. Very good. So discharge not submitted to payer, payer is everything from the moment of discharge to the moment it walks in, the claim walks in the door of, of the payer. Uh, and uh, that is composed of discharge not final build and then final build not submitted. So thank you very much for your participation in that. And uh, the next set of polling questions will all pertain to the material that we are about to start talking about next. So what are we going to talk about next? We're going to talk about a more a granular approach to the revenue cycle. And uh, you already see, let me see, see that uh, um, Well, you're going to, uh, I'm going to take us through the book and then come back to the slides here. Okay, so back to the book and uh, the section on the revenue cycle up front. Specifically, we are at page um, 74. That's where I'm going to go right now myself. So we are at the end of this section with uh, um, map keys, okay? And now we're going to have to go a little bit more deeply into the different uh, elements of the revenue cycle, which will also take us heavily into the uh, into Medicare. And we're going to start... Off, before you get started, we had a question come in about the poll. And yes. The, in DNSP, wouldn't you also need to divide DNSP plus FBNS by the average daily gross revenue? Yes, uh, yes. If you, very good question, thank you. That is if you wanted to uh, show this information as, as days. Yes, that's what you would do. But you might also just want to measure that as a dollar amount um, and, and treat it as a, as a backlog with with dollars and then you know to get the most out of a, an effort to reduce it you would look for ways to get the highest dollar accounts through that pipeline the quickest uh, and pick up some some speed and some cash 
accelerate the cache that way. But you're right, if you wanted to show it as days, you would have to divide by average daily revenue and it probably would be gross charges that you would divide by unless your system nets down the dollars uh, right away, even already at the before billing. But I wouldn't think that a computer system would do that. So this entire calculation would have to be done on a gross basis um, in order to be meaningful. Okay, so we're now needing to talk about uh, other aspects of the pipeline in a more granular way. And uh, back to our pipeline view here, Right now, the, the, the box we're going to talk about next is this HIM box right here because it's, uh, it's a complicated one and it leads us into all kinds of other directions. So, so the thing that I start with here and where I go deep is in the area of coding, uh, an area that uh, we seem to uh, delegate to people who know very much about this and then most rest of us know relatively little about and I think of coders uh, uh, as, a, as a venerated group of, uh, of Tibetan monks that, uh, that wear saffron colored robes that uh, uh, shave their heads and that chant as they walk through the hospital because on them depends really our entire cash flow think about computer systems. Computer systems until very recently couldn't read text very well and now they can but uh, in order to boil down the complexity of, of the healthcare clinical area into something that a computer system can understand we have to rely on codes which are ways of translating clinical events and outcomes uh, and, and, and problems into information that a computer can understand and process. And so we have developed coding systems to help us with that. And these coding systems are uh, uh, things that you need to know on the exam. Okay, so we all know that there is something called the ICD-9 system about to be replaced a year from uh, tomorrow with the ICD-10 system. Uh, but uh, do we really know very much about it? Both of them are uh, systems that uh, turn diagnoses and inpatient procedures into machine readable uh, format. Okay, so they are a, digno a diagnosis system and a procedure system, but a procedure system only for inpatients, only for inpatients, not for outpatients. Uh, what is the history of the ICD-9 system? It, it originated in Europe uh, a long time ago as a system to classify diseases. Ebola, I'm sure, is a code in the ICD-9 lexicon, but we have since uh, um, adapted this system to uh, a clinical usage uh, in the in, in, in our healthcare systems. Uh, so we have uh, created a system that uh, we has, has been known until now as the ICD-9-CM system, which stands for clinical modification, clinical modified version of the system. Okay, it's maintained by the U.S. National Center for Health Statistics and uh, this system used to be called the ICD-9 CM system. It still is and it, it codes, uh, it classifies diagnoses and inpatient procedures. Now it's going to be replaced and you see this date here, I really need to change. It, it's not upon us for another year. Um, uh, has run out of space and uh, so the people who do things like this have uh, decided to create a system that has more space and the ICD-10 system expands the diagnosis code significantly and also a procedure code significantly to allow us to denote a lot of the things that we otherwise uh, can't very easily in the system, the current system itself. Now the new book 
more clearly distinguishes between the procedure coding side, which it calls uh, ICD-10-CM, and the inpatient procedure coding side, which is called ICD-10-PCS. And the codes look very, very different. You see some uh, ICD-9 codes here, diagnosis code. Here's a typical format for one. Here's a procedure code you can tell by uh, size, just alone by the size and the structure of the code, what it is. And but, and but look at how complicated the ICD-10 codes look. Again, you can tell by the structure of it what, whether it's a diagnosis or procedure code. Uh, but the similar, the you know, the, there's no similarity there to our existing ICD-9 system at all. So that's uh, the backbone of our system. And if you look through the ICD-9 uh, or ICD-10-CM book, and look at uh, at look at uh, diagnosis codes. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, not a very uplifting experience because what you're reading are all of the things that kill people and that that make people sick. It's a catalog of of human malady, so to speak. Um, and um, so that's a diagnosis and inpatient procedure coding system. But I told you on the outpatient side. And the physician side, we use something different, and it's the CPT-4 system. It is proprietary. It's owned by the American Medical Association, and it is relatively new. Uh, it's in its fourth edition now, and um, it is proprietary, which means that if you want to use it, which uh, 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 for instance CMS uses and, and uh, many payers do, uh, you have to accept the terms and conditions on the internet, uh, uh, bowing your head to uh, the American Medical Association, which licenses this system for our use. So in, I, CPT was uh, designed around everything that doctors do, office visits and procedures, and hospital outpatient procedures. So that's what the CPT-4 catalog encompasses. Again, it translates it into machine-readable form. Um, now, what has since been done is that the CMS, or its predecessor, HICFA, uh, in uh, a little over 20 years ago, licensed the CPT-4 system and uh, uh, turned it into a system called HICPIX, or the Healthcare Procedural Coding System, HICPIX. The HICPIX book has basically three volumes. Think of it that way. Volume one is all of CPT-4, lock, stock, and barrel, no changes. HICPIX level two are services that um, are non-physician ambulance services, medical devices, drugs, supplies. In other words, the book has since expanded beyond things that doctors do. And then there are also in this level two Medicare specific physician uh, services like Medicare flu shots and wellness exams, things are, that are specific to Medicare. And in that cost volume profit uh, uh, analysis, that sample, that example I showed you about pulmonary rehab, that was a G code, G0424, which is pulmonary rehab. That is a Medicare specific code. That's a, an example of a level two HICPICS codes. Those codes all start with a letter, whereas the uh, HICPICS 1 or CPT 4 codes are all five digit numeric. Okay, so that's how those systems work. And here are some examples. Here's a level 1 code, here's a level 2 code, an ambulance code, or here's a G code. This is a Medicare annual wellness visit. Okay, so now it gives you a sense of what the samples look like. Uh, what these coding systems look like. And then there are such a thing as, uh, as uh, modifiers, which uh, are a two-digit uh, suffix to a CPT or HICPIC code that uh, somehow modify the service or convey additional information that uh, is not contained in the code per se. Now, I told you that the existing CPT uh, ICD-9 system has run out of uh, 
out of space and, and we have helped ourselves uh, meanwhile by creating something called E codes and V codes and E codes are uh, a set of codes that, that pertain to external causes of injury. Here's some examples of E codes. Here, railway accident involving explosion, fire, or burning, accident to spacecraft, injuring occupant of spacecraft, and misadventures to patients during surgical and medical care. That could be, uh, uh, those are probably some codes that CMS watches very, very carefully because those would possibly be never events that uh, would uh, not look good in the eyes of a patient or the public or a payer. And then ICD-10 codes are uh, uh, injury code. Uh, so the E codes are built into the ICD-10 system and you can see how specific you can get in uh, di diagnosing, uh, in specifying injury codes in the new ICD-10 systems. It, it, it can be almost humorous when you see someone being struck by lightning a second time. That's the code you would use. Okay, and then there are V codes, which are supplementary codes. They are actually still carried over into ICD-10. Here are some very common examples that you see a lot in the revenue cycle, these particular V codes. Okay, so cognitive coding definitive diagnoses in an uncertain world. Uh, uh, to diagnose means to recognize as a disease by signs and symptoms but uh, uh, frequently the doctor isn't quite sure and sometimes what they, the doctor, the best they can do is uh, saying it's probable or rule out or limit themselves to describing a patient's signs and symptoms. And the rules for that are different for the inpatient side than for the outpatient side. And I tell you what those differences are here in, on this particular page and please pay uh, attention to this. Even if this is not asked on the exam, this is very, very useful information for a financial manager to know. Coders, of course, know this, HIM people know this, but the rest of us are not are not on very, we're on quicksand when it comes to coding frequently. So I've tried to remedy that by putting some of that here into this book, including talking about reasons for visit. So that's kind of a deep dive right now into this box right here, this HIM box, and we're gonna come up for air for a moment and dive again deeper into it again. And the one we're gonna dive into is this one, this billing and collections box, and the very first dive into that is this diagram which shows you um, how the area that we have already talked about when we talked about DNFB and FBNS and so forth already covered somewhat and that is how a claim actually makes its way uh, from a hospital information system into the Medicare payment system, the uh, FIS system. Um, that uh, um, adjudicate in which Medicare claims are adjudicated. So in the hospital information system, a lot of information gets gathered together. It comes from all of these uh, uh, steps in the pipeline. And uh, usually you have a hold uh, period at the end after a patient has been discharged, which, which is probably three days, uh, sometimes longer. It, it really can't Are you there? Hey, Christoph, we lost your audio. Oh, can you hear me again? Yes. Okay, how long have I been gone? Just now? About a minute, I'd say. Oh, I'm sorry. I must have accidentally, with my leg, pressed a, a mute button here on my control. Sorry about that. Thank you for pointing out to me. So I'm, what I'm walking you through is the 
what happens in a computer system when a claim goes from unbuilt to build after a period of a, a number of whole days, uh, typically three days or sometimes longer, usually not any shorter than that, to allow for charging and documentation processes to be completed. So now the account is moves from unbuilt to build. It goes from unbuilt or a UB status to an FB status, final build status. And uh, the claim now goes into a claim scrubber. That claim scrubber is either uh, built into the main computer system and contains all of the specific payer edits or it's a piece of software that's bolted on to your main computer system and uh, uh, scrubs the claim for payer specific edits and that process is described here in this box called claim scrubber and uh, these rules are, are uh, complicated they change all the time and so either you do it yourself you build these into your own system or you hire someone to, to pay attention to these claims and make sure they're constantly updated. And then once a claim passes those edits, it goes to the clearinghouse. Now, if you ask someone in healthcare to define a clearinghouse, uh, try that sometime and see what kinds of answers you get. Uh, I don't know if people really understand what a clearinghouse really is. It's an e-commerce tool. I think of it as a traffic cop that uh, regulates the traffic between a provider and a payer. If you think of a world without a clearinghouse, that's maybe in a better way or an easier way to understand what a clearinghouse does. If you didn't have a clearinghouse, each provider would have to have a, uh, its own connection to each payer you essentially would have to have a login to that payer's uh, computer system. You would have to manually transmit your claims to that payer through their uh, 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 e-commerce inbox. And then once the payer uh, um, creates a remittance and is uh, paying you, you would have to go back into that mailbox, find your file, your PDF file, of uh, remittances and uh, bring it into your computer system and post from it. So Clearinghouse essentially is a one-stop shopping place where all of the electronic commerce goes from the payer out to the, uh, from the provider to the payer and in reverse from the payer to the provider. It greatly simplifies our lives. And then what happens in these important boxes, Medicare pending, Medicare suspense and Medicare paid is described in these other columns. When a claim is adjudicated, uh, uh, the, the first thing um, the Medicare system looks for is do I recognize this patient? Uh, is this beneficiary? And beneficiary is the name that Medicare uses for all patients. Is this beneficiary uh, in my system, in my FIS system? Uh, and you recognize a patient by their HICN number. That is uh, the, uh, our a patient's or beneficiary's social security number with a, with a suffix added to the end of it. We'll look at suffixes for HICN numbers in a moment. And uh, those kinds of claims that don't even make it through the front door are RTP'd or returned to provider. Uh, all payers have something like this, uh, whether it's called RTP or not, that happens to be what the Medicare systems call it. And then you can fix in the Medicare, if this were a Medicare claim, you go into the DDE system, which is a direct data entry system, old, old, old fashioned character based computer system that uh, uh, allows you online to correct, say, a HICA number and, re, and uh, uh, resubmit the claim. And uh, RTPs not corrected in 60 days are deleted. So if you for, forget to clear your RTPs on a daily basis, uh, uh, don't be surprised if you'll never get paid for those. You have to then um, um, resubmit them. And uh, then when a claim goes in suspense, here's what happens. Uh, um, the, each uh, Medicare administrative contractor is tied to 
something called the common working file, which is talk about big data. This is one huge file. It contains every claim of every Medicare beneficiary from anywhere in the country. And it is used to see if Medicare is primary or if Medicare is secondary to other insurance. We'll talk about Medicare as secondary payer in a little while, some more. So that determination is made by running a claim through the common working file, which basically says that uh, uh, John Doe is uh, working, flipping hamburgers at McDonald's, although he's a Medicare patient, so Medicare is secondary to, to his McDonald's insurance. And, that's, uh, uh, and then let's say he stops working for McDonald's and Medicare is now primary, uh, uh, then that gets, uh, the common wor working file gets updated by a particular code on a UB04 claim telling CMS that Medicare is to be primary. There is no other insurance for this beneficiary and that information gets stored in the common working file. And then claims that are submitted electronically get paid very, very quickly. Uh, you see there's an incentive to bill electronically. You get paid in 13 days rather than in 29 days. So this is very specific information. Many of us know this kind of sort of, but it, I think it's very useful to be very, very precise about what exactly happens and what these things are called and how they work. So that's a deep dive into another area. Denial management is another area where we're going to quickly Die, dive into it's this box right here, this denial processing box right here. So what is the what is a denial? Okay, again, ask someone and you would get uh, ask two people, you'll probably get different answers about it. So I'm trying to make uh, denials as simple uh, to understand as possible, and I'm. Re relying here on an article from November 2005 in the HFMA magazine, which I think uh, classifies denials uh, entirely correctly. It, it distinguishes between provider errors and payer errors, or both of them are denials. Um, and amongst provider errors, it distinguishes between clinical and technical administrative uh, denials. Clinical denials are exactly what the name says. They are uh, they are related to medical necessity uh, and level of care, uh, emergent, non-emergent, and and these are things that uh, uh, really are best handled by a nurse, uh, and that's why it's utilization review or care management, which are staffed with nurses that handle these kinds of denials. They might appeal a claim on the basis of medical necessity. Uh, Non-covered service is harder to appeal because the rules on that are pretty clear. Level of care would be something, medical necessity is a concept that applies more to outpatients. Level of care more to inpatients and emergent, non-emergent would be something having to do with emergency as the name says, the emergency department. Then there are lots of, uh, there are hundreds of technical administrative uh, denial codes in use, literally hundreds. Uh, uh, by Medicare alone, this, the, the, this list is very, very long, the, the list of standard Medicare denial codes. And just add to that all of the denial codes used by all the other payers. So here's a way to classify, to boil down those hundreds of codes into, into a, a much shorter list of uh, uh, reasons. And uh, this, I think this is a good list and it allows a computer system then to route uh, these hundreds of denials to the right person to to work them. And um, I just like this list. I think it's short and it uh, it covers the territory. And then underpayments are described here. And you notice that these uh, technical denials and underpayments are worked by, typically by non-clinical people, by business office access services or revenue integrity staff, sometimes also contracting gets involved. So that's a bit of a deep dive into, into the denial box. And now we're going to have to talk about Medicare. 
it's more specifically, although we've already touched on Medicare. Here's a definition of what Medicare A is and what Medicare B is, what C is, and what D is. So read that very, very carefully. Know this stuff, okay? Um, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, two things, uh, the ABN and the MSP, before we talk about the Medi three of the Medicare's chief payment systems, IPPS, OPPS, and PFS, Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. So first, let's talk about ABNs. What is, a, what is an ABN? Here's the description, here's the, uh, the long uh, title, it's advanced Beneficiary, beneficiary notice. Advance means it, it happens in advance of something else. Beneficiary, that's Medicare's name for a patient. And notice, okay, so we're telling the beneficiary something ahead of time. That's what an ABN do, does and is. It's a document that a patient is given in the case that the doctor has written on, on the on the prescription pad for Susie Smith, I am ordering a such and such test and the diagnosis code or the ICD-9 CM code or the ICD-10 CM code for this uh, order is such and such. Well, uh, since Medicare is an open payment system that does it's not require authorizations and certifications and notifications, but essentially will pay any conforming claim. Uh, you need some kind of a control over what gets paid and what doesn't get paid. And so what CMS has done is it has created lists, long, long lists of code pairs of ICD-9 diagnosis codes and CPT-4 or HCPCS procedure codes that don't fit together, that don't make any sense uh, uh, together. And those codes are denied as being medically unnecessary. Now, a doctor may insist that I still want to do this because I suspect it will help me if I do this test or lab test or imaging procedure, it will help me understand what's wrong with my patient. And uh, the since Medicare won't pay for it, uh, the patient has to decide whether they are willing to pay for this medically unnecessary, I know that these are harsh words, this medically unnecessary test or procedure. And uh, by signing the ABN form, the patient says, yes, I will pay for this. If such a form is not obtained from the patient, then of course Medicare won't pay, but Medicare will also instruct the provider not to bill the patient for it, so the provider eats the cost of it. So ABNs are important. They're mainly a tool, or they are entirely a tool for outpatient work. There is a similar form called a notice of non-coverage for inpatients. Its use is rarer. It would be used if a patient uh, for the social reasons or familiar reasons says, no, I can't go home, I don't have a place to go. And uh, the hospital says, well, in that case, you're going to have to pay for your room charges and your care for that extra day yourself. So that's when a notice of non-coverage would be issued for an inpatient. Quite rare, I would think. Um, so that's what an ABN is. A Medicare secondary payer form is a form that is exactly what the name says. It's, uh, it, uh, it wants to establish, or it's, its purpose is to establish who pays first. Medicare uh, wants to lead from behind. Of course, Medicaid is the payer of last resort. They're going to be last in line. But Medicare is sometimes prime, sometimes secondary. If there is a uh, slip and fall on a banana peel on your neighbor's uh, front porch, uh, Medicare is going to be secondary to uh, your neighbor's uh, homeowner's policy. If you are in a motor vehicle accident, Medicare is secondary to your the medical coverage under your auto insurance. So the Medicare secondary payer form establishes that. That's the information that updates the common working file by which Medicare then knows uh, uh, whether the patient has other coverage or not. So that's really um, what the text here 
uh, talks about in more specific specificity and it talks about outpatient medical necessity and these code pairs that get denied. Um, these uh, code pairs initially come from local coverage determinations where local uh, medical review committees establish these lists and that have since also been turned into national coverage determinations or NCDs but it all started at at the local level that's how Medicare wanted it so as to give local doctors a say in what Medicare pays for or not. Here's a list of uh, uh, ICD-9 codes that are permissible with a DEXA scan code 77080. So this is an example of uh, codes that, you, diagnosis codes that permit uh, performing a DEXA scan. Okay, so then I talk a little bit about uh, how um, the, these uh, NCDs actually make very interesting reading even for or maybe particularly for a financial person. For one thing, it tells you exactly um, what an MRI is. Okay, so if you always wanted to know what uh, an MRI is, it's defined in an NCD and then it defines also what the uses of uh, an MRI are, and it's kind of a little bit of a history of medicine. You know, MRIs came around uh, in, in, in numbers in the 1980s, so the first uh, medical necessity determination around uh, MRIs is from 1985, and then you see in 1994 it was expanded, and, and you would see this in other imaging procedures as well. And then when we come to inpatient medical necessity, we uh, completely change uh, uh, things around because here we cannot rely so much on simple code pairs, ICD-9 and CPT code pairs that are either in or out, but we have to rely on the criteria on clinical standards that are far more complicated and the, t the, the, the standard ones are Interqual and Milliman. So they are the two publishers of this kind of uh, body of knowledge, constantly updated, and uh, payers usually use this material as well. And uh, you, you, you are uh, utilization review nurses that prowl the hallways of your organization uh, and wear name tags that say Blue Cross on them or Aetna who are in other words doing utilization review on patients in your facility uh, with the intent to uh, make sure that the level of care is appropriate and the, the payer doesn't pay unnecessarily for care, they are going to use these interqual or Milliman guidelines to, to determine whether the patient is being treated appropriately uh, and is in the right setting. So that's how inpatient medical necessity works. And again, there's some examples of it here. For instance, an ad adult liver transplant. Here are the medical, here are the uh, criteria for a liver transplant. You can read them in these uh, coverage determinations. Very, very interesting. And then Medicare secondary payer we've already talked about. Okay, that brings us to the inpatient prospective payment system and let us do some polling questions first and uh, let's start with uh, polling question number one. Sean, please show everyone the first polling question. Now this is something we haven't explicitly talked about, I've talked about in a roundabout way when we talked about coding systems, but hopefully you will be able to answer this from your own knowledge. Got about 10 seconds left and then we'll close the poll.
there are the results, Christoph? And the right answer is D, and that is the answer that uh, uh, got the most answers. Uh, okay, so just as a matter of definitions, IPPS stands for inpatient prospective payment system. That's how acute care hospitals are paid for inpatient uh, care. OPPS is the outpatient prospective payment system for outpatients and the MPFS is, stands for the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. Now in terms of age of these systems, the granddaddy of these is the IPPS system which uh, started 31 years ago in 1983. Prior to that, Medicare for the first uh, almost 20 years of existence from 1960 to 1983, Medicare paid on a reasonable cost basis, um, but uh, uh, it then went to a prospective payment system which has been with us ever since, which rewards efficient providers of care and penalizes inefficient ones. That system was extended to outpatients in uh, the summer of 2000, so that system has been around for 14 years, and its payment mechanism are not DRGs, but APCs. And then the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule has been around since the early 1990s, so it is uh, about 10 years younger than the uh, IPPS system, and we will talk some more about it uh, in a little while. Next question, please, Sean. Uh, polling question number two. about 10 seconds left to vote before we'll close the poll. And there are the poll results. Very good. The right answer is C. Um, the CPT4 system encompasses visits and procedures. Uh, in other words, everything a doctor does. Um, inpatient procedures, remember, are the realm of ICD-9 uh, inpatient procedure codes, or in the ICD-10 world, they're called ICD-10 PCS for procedure coding systems. So those are um, systems that are used for MPFS and OPPS billing, and that is the right answer. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, question number three. This is something we haven't talked about. I'm testing your existing knowledge of uh, Medicare here. We have about 10 seconds left to vote again. And 
there are the results. D is the right answer, but I noticed there are uh, quite a few people who answered A, B, and C. And um, uh, what I will say to you is uh, that you really just can't learn everything you need to know in uh, on on the revenue cycle or any other area for this exam in a webinar like this. So uh, take take. Uh, take this as uh, my encouragement to you to study this book, take the time to read it and absorb this knowledge in, in little chunks if necessary or bigger chunks if you have the time and, and know, know what Medicare pays for and understand what provider-based billing is and how it works. Uh, let us do one more question, number four, and then we will go on with our discussion of the payment systems. Number four, please, Sean. There you go. This is one you should be able to get right based on what uh, we've talked about today. See, we have a lot of people who have not voted yet. We have about 10 seconds left in the voting. Okay, the right answer is A, uh, ICD-10 PCS codes are used to code inpatient procedures, ICD-9-10CM codes are used to code in and outpatient diagnoses. Okay, so that's the right answer and uh, read about it in the coding section that I know I went through very, very quickly but uh, you will learn that and, and more in that coding section. So thank you, Sean. Thank you, audience. Now let's talk about the IPPS system. Now, meanwhile, since 1983, just about all of the payment systems have been uh, revised and become uh, uh, prospective payment systems based on some kind of uh, a, a way to set rates ahead of time and then pay uh, 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 providers along according to those standard rates. Uh, those payment systems um, uh, generally start from something like, a, that's pictured here by this geodetic marker from the top of Mount Whitney at 14,000. 494 feet. They start from a single point of reference and build out from there. So the DRG system, which is the IPPS uh, payment mechanism uh, of uh, MSDRGs, there are seven, 750 of those. This called MSDRGs because they're Medicare severity adjusted. Before that, they were just called DRGs. Um, all take uh, um, all point to a single amount from which um, they are calculated. And uh, let us see what that system is. There's no better way to learn that than by this diagram right here. This is on page about 85 in your book. So turn there, please, and then follow along here on the screen. So that geodetic marker uh, from which the entire payment system uh, originates used to be a single dollar amount. It used to be the, the, 
the sum of these two boxes here on the left, the very left, the standardized amount and the capital federal rate. Well, about 20 years ago, they were split apart. And ever since then, we've had the schema that you, you have before you right now. So the geodetic marker really is, is the sum of these two numbers. Uh, they just happen to be split out in this way. So what are they? The standardized amount, the higher of these two amounts, pays hospitals for the provision of uh, um, care and, and their operating expenses in the provision of care. That's all I want to say for operating expenses. The capital federal rate, the smaller amount down here, uh, reimburses providers for the depreciation or use of its facilities and its equipment. Um, they follow slightly different paths. The operating amount, which is called the standardized amount, by um, study, uh, analysis of a lot of data, and I don't know if it was the RAND Corp or MIT or CMS in Baltimore that crunched the numbers, but someone figured out that labor costs account for 68.8% of total operating costs. And remember when we were looking at uh, uh, our financial statements the first week here, uh, and I'm looking at the statement of operations here. Notice, I mean, if you take the salaries and wages and the employee benefits, that's, you know, that's maybe more than half here. But if you take depreciation out, here that number out, because that's compensated under the federal capital rate, it's probably about two thirds. Okay, so that validates that that's the, whoever cr crunched the numbers must have gotten it about right. So the non-labor costs are everything else uh, that's not on a, uh, a W-2 form, in other words, it's supplies, and those costs are presumed not to vary uh, geographically. They're going to be the same in Puerto Rico or Hawaii or uh, Chicago, Illinois. Um, and that's 31.2% of the total operating costs. So the labor costs, however, do vary. I'm showing you here uh, how, for instance, in Portland, Oregon, uh, the wage index is about 10% or 11% above the, the, the national average, and these numbers are recalculated every year. So the labor component gets inflated by this uh, wage index. Um, to derive or determine the payment rate uh, for Portland, Oregon Hospital there. The non-labor costs, uh, which are, um, you know, paid for under, frequently under uh, uh, group purchasing agreements, national contracts, etc., are not going to vary. So they're not inflated or adjusted for, for local conditions. Now, what determines this wage index? It's a, a core-based statistical area, CBSA, that uh, uh, maybe is dependent on the census data on the, uh, uh, or other uh, information by uh, the economists uh, in this world that, that measure these things. Now, in the future, what Medicare wants to do is make the uh, adjust the labor portion actually by the zip code of where the employees live. So they want to go one up on this current system of CBSAs and uh, look at the uh, actual addresses where employees come from. Why is that? Because many organizations, many hospitals ask to be reclassified into higher uh, paying CBSA is simply saying that our employees all drive to Salem, Oregon from Portland where the wages are higher. Therefore, we ought to be paid more uh, so we can pay our employees more. So, so many hospitals have been reclassified that the system has become uh, uh, weakened by that, uh, the integrity of it, and so they're thinking of changing that. So you add these amounts together, you come up with the payment rate for Portland for labor and non-labor costs, and you inflate the 
federal, uh, the capital federal rate by a hard hat index, which is different from the wage index. It is uh, uh, based on CBSA also, and you add them together and you come up with a, a payment for the case weight of one. Now, I don't know if there is a, a DRG that exactly has a case weight of one, but if there were, this is what a hospital in Portland in fiscal year 2012 was paid for that imaginary case. Now, if you uh, go to a particular MSDRG in this particular example, it's MSDRG 226, you multiply, and that has a case weight of 6.7895, you multiply this uh, standard uh, uh, dollar amount by that case weight and that's how you calculate what Medicare pays for a particular DRG. Now in the real world we have computer systems that do this for us, be they from MetaAssets or uh, Optum or other vendors, uh, so we rarely do a calculation like this, if ever, but uh, for purposes of the exam, while you don't have to do a calculation, let me repeat, you don't have to actually uh, plug in the numbers to do this. You need to be familiar with the morphology of this diagram, with the structure of this diagram, what uh, what gets updated uh, by what, okay? Uh, and it's also just good common knowledge for a well-educated financial manager to know this. So there is an example in the in our material a case study, which we're not going to have time for. I'm going to just take us there. Uh, here's the case study. So imagine a hospital in Evansville, Indiana, and I think there are people from the Indiana Pressler chapter uh, participating. This this is an actual, I looked up the data, they are in CBSA 21780, and uh, then you, I give you the data to look up in the Federal Register what the, uh, all the information you need to calculate the reimbursement for MSDRG 511. This is actual picture of the hospital right here. So how does the data actually look in the, in the Federal Register? Since most of us have not looked at a Federal Register and looked at the IPPS proposed or final rules, here are some of the tables. I'm just showing them to you for illustrative purposes here. Um, here are those amounts you just saw a moment ago for labor related and non-labor related. Here is the capital federal rate right here in yellow. And here is a table that shows you the wage index and the geographic, the hard hat index. So for Portland, Oregon, the labor index is here, the hard hat index is next to it. And then here is a DRG table that shows you what the case weight is. This again from the Federal Register, DRG 226, case weight of 6.7895, has a geometric mean length of stay of six days in the hospital. The arithmetic mean length of stay is actually 8.7. So very powerful information. It's so useful, I think, to know how this is done uh, once in your life. If never again, at least you know how it works. Moving on now to OPPS, the Outpatient Prospective Payment System. I told you it is... Do you have a is, couple questions if I can interrupt for just a Absolutely, Sean. Go for it. Um, does the mix of labor percent and non-labor percent vary from year to year? Uh, I don't think it does. It does, however, uh, uh, depend on the labor index. Uh, I um, um, kind of glossed over this. For hospitals that ha have a wage index below a one, the split is slightly different. Uh, I leave it at that. Um, what I showed you was the split for a hospital above a one. All of this is somewhat arbitrary, but those are just the, the way the rules are. And uh, actually for OPPS, which we're about to launch into, the split is 60-40. It's a different split. And it, if you look at the number 60-40, uh, you know, it has a more arbitrary look and feel to it than 
one that's this 68.8 and 31.2 uh, or whatever. Uh, but um, over time, these things do get revised. Yes, I mean, they are not static. These things are fluid. The follow-up question to that is how often do the standardized amounts and wage indexes change? Every year. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, what's the difference between the geometric or arithmetic mean and which should we be using? Oh my goodness. First of all, you don't have to use either, okay? Okay. You don't have to use either. And then second of all, I uh, uh, I ought to know the answer between geometric and arithmetic mean, and uh, and I don't. Sorry, uh, I think I will Google that tonight and and look it up myself because I'm interested. But I can't answer that. Final question I have up on the screen goes back to our polling question: Will the ICD-10 PCS eventually replace the CPT codes? No. Good question. CPT codes or HCPCS codes are just a completely different system. I, you know, there is an ICD-11 already in in draft form. It's a year old. I think it maintains uh, this this split the way it is right now. And uh, you know, Canada also uses ICD. They're already on ICD-10. They must have something like a CPT system as well. I don't know what it is they use, or Germany, what, what, how they uh, uh, measure outpatient and, and physician office work. But uh, for us, they are not going to become the same. Good questions. Thank you. That's all the questions Thank we have right now. Yeah, super. Okay, OPPS system um, applies this prospective payment idea to the outpatient world, partic name, and, and what are we talking about? We're talking about office visits and hospital outpatient work. That's really what we're talking about here. So it's what people do in their doctors do in their offices and what doctors do in, in an outpatient setting. And these, uh, uh, the system repay, replaced a fee schedule system, uh, and some fee schedules still exist, uh, but they're going to go away eventually too. And uh, so, how does this system work? Well, there are probably, I'm guessing, about 15,000 HitFix codes. I actually don't know, and if someone in the audience has an answer or knows even how to look it up please send me an email. I'd love to know how many HICPICS codes there are. I, I suppose I could download the HICPICS table from CMS and see how many rows in Excel that is. I think it's around, it's somewhere between 12 and 15,000. Uh, this system of HICPICS codes gets boiled down to uh, uh, a much, much smaller number of APCs and my question my challenge to the audience is if someone knows how many APCs there are, please share that, I will uh, uh, let you know next week how many APCs there are. There are probably about a thousand, I'm guessing. So it's a, 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 a 10 to 1 uh, simplification that takes place by uh, using APCs. Uh, APCs stand for ambulatory patient classification that is in here someplace. Uh, it's defined here someplace, I hope it is. Yeah, ambulatory patient Payment classification is that that's what the acronym stands for. Okay, how does it work? Very important to know. Although the example I'm showing here is a little out of date, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, the, the real know people who know this stuff will immediately see why this is out of date. Um, but uh, so you have APCs here. Um, these are the a thousand or so more high-level uh, things that get paid. They have relative weights, just like uh, DRGs have relative weights. And uh, uh, in the case of this 0604, the reduction ratio is five to one. There are five HICPICS codes that map to that particular APC code. You see, in some cases, it's 29 CPT codes map to this laparoscopy code. In, in, in some cases, it's just one-to-one, -one. and in other cases, I don't know why there's no number here in the column on the right. I just took this off a table, and uh, I couldn't tell you why why there are no numbers here. So there's a, 
a reduction here. Now picture, go back to our diagram from a moment ago, the IPPS diagram. Remember that the standardized payment for a DRG of a case weight of one is about $6,000. You know what the uh, uh, standardized payment for a relative weight of one is on an APC? It's about $70, about $70. So in rough terms, it's an APC pays one one hundredth of a DRG. So you see the unit is a much, much smaller unit. If you extend that relationship also to the Medicare physician fee schedule, where you also deal with relative weights, they're called RVUs, the, uh, um, the standardized amount is about $35. So about half again of an APC gives you a sense of relative magnitude of, of the unit of measurement in these payment systems. Now notice that uh, there is this thing called an SI here that stands for status indicator. What, mean, what that means is that some APCs are paid discreetly, others are paid uh, uh, by taking an, a cut in the reimbursement. These are visit codes, they are paid discreetly. So if, uh, if uh, the uh, standardized amount for uh, uh, APC system or PPS system is about $70, and this is uh, 0.7 of $70, so this pays about $45. That's immediately, you can tell how much this is gonna pay that way. This is gonna pay about $70, this is gonna pay maybe $100 this next month, and so forth and so on. Notice that the highest one here is a pacemaker insertion has a relative weight of 93, so it's worth 93 times $70 in its reimbursement methodology. So V codes with a status indicator SI of, of a V all get paid. S codes are significant procedures. They also all get paid. X codes are ancillary codes. They also all get paid. So if someone has an allergy test, a cardiac stress test, a pulmonary test all on one day, they, uh, the provider would get paid each of these together. Now the T codes are uh, procedures where only the highest weighted one gets paid at 100%. All the others get, get haircutted, get a haircut and get paid at 50%. So if someone had all of these T codes, this one right here, the 93 would be paid at 100%. The other ones each would be cut in half. Uh, so that's, how that mechanism works. Think of it as a, a doctor doing a, a five toe operations, uh, if there were such a thing, I don't know. The big toe would get paid at, at 100% and the other four toes each at 40, at 50%. So the sum total payment would be three times the, uh, 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 the standardized amount for this rather than five times. So two toes, uh, uh, the doctor doesn't get paid for uh, discreetly under the assumption that when you're doing multiple procedures of that particular kind that are denoted by a status indicator of T, the, there is some efficiency to be gained by doing more than one at a time and thus only the highest weighted one gets paid in full, the others get paid at half. So that's how this works and then here is a table that shows the five codes that are mapped into an 0604. So these five codes right here are shown here on this next page and uh, you can see what it is that uh, all encompass, is encompassed by 0604 namely an office visit for a new patient, an office visit for an established patient, and then some other stuff. These are G codes, these are HICPIX codes. You can see by the, the fact that they start with the G. These other two are uh, CPT codes that are in the HICPIX volume one under uh, level one HICPIX codes. So for Medicare, what this means that whether you're a new patient or an established patient, you get paid the same amount. Now that's essentially how this system works. Now there is uh, one more feature here 
that's noteworthy, and then we're done talking about OPPS, and that is that some items don't even get recognized in the OPPS world at all. They essentially, if they show up on a UBO4 form, pretty much draw a line through them because you're not going to get a cent for them. And here are some examples. Routine supplies, anesthesia, operating and recovery room use, implantable, implantable medical devices. You already saw with that pacemaker, it was included in the APC, so you can't have a, a, a line item for the surgery and then another one for the device. The device would be unpaid, unreimbursed because it's already included in, in the procedure itself. Inexpensive drugs are not paid and uh, as new this year, most diagnostic lab tests are now also not paid. Okay, so think of it as a claim where the certain lines just simply get ruled out, taken out, not paid. So the how does all of this work? How does a computer system know how to do this? Well, they are um, edits, uh, the NCCI edits, they're described here. MUE edits are another set of edits that are built that edit claims and make sure that the, the things that shouldn't get paid because they're packaged or things that are medically not necessary get uh, taken out. Uh, we already talked about the status indicators and then here what actually uh, uh, gets assigned those surgeries are usually a T. So if it's more than one surgery on a day, there is a, a discounting that takes place. Um, the radiology, uh, uh, usually each radiology, many re radiology things have their own discrete APCs. Uh, E&M codes uh, are never discounted, we already talked about, and then ancillary services, the X's, are sometimes packaged and sometimes paid in full. By package it means they get ruled out and not paid at all or sometimes they get paid in full. So how does this work? Here's a way in which the factor gets uh, updated every year. You don't need to know this but it's interesting to know. Uh, uh, the government taketh and the government taketh away, giveth and taketh away. You see that here in these update factors. Um, and then uh, I already told you that um, the payment system uh, uh, divides uh, the cost into a labor piece which is 60% and a non-labor piece of 40% and the labor piece gets updated by the very same hospital wage index that we encountered in IPPS and the 40% uh, non-labor piece does not get updated at all, it's paid the same wherever it is. So an example would be how this actually works and I, uh, since uh, what would a webinar on the revenue cycle be without a UB04 somewhere in the material, there is one in your book for a um, an imaginary patient called Joanna Q. Patient uh, who lives in Mo any town Oregon, went to Mossy Green Hospital and had a whole bunch of terrible things. Uh, a level 5 emergency visit, a burn treatment, a fracture treatment, a pacemaker and other stuff. And uh, the example shows you how uh, uh, OPPS, the OPPS system would reimburse this system. Now certain things like the anesthesia would uh, not be paid. I already told you anesthesia is uh, lined out, so are medical surgery supplies and so is recovery room. So those three lines, these last two lines, forget that there's even a dollar amount here. They wouldn't get paid. These other ones would pay, be paid. So the question is only are some of them packaged uh, uh, in some way? Is there a multiple procedure discounting going on and so forth? And you can figure out what the payment is and that's shown to you here. Uh, here are the five codes that actually do get paid. Here are the APCs that they uh, 
uh, are tied to. Here's the indicator, the status indicator. Notice there were three T's. So of the three, this one, the highest one, is going to get paid at 100%. So how this works is you see that an unadjusted payment rate, which is published in the Federal Register, gets divided into a labor portion, which is subject to the labor index, a non-labor portion, which isn't, and then is there this discounting going on, yes or no, and you can determine exactly what the payment would be. Again, what you've done here is uh, do what a computer system otherwise would do for you. You've just simply done it yourself. Okay, we're running a little short on time. We need to do some more polling questions. Let us do polling question number six and follow it by polling question number seven. Question number six is up. Um, while we are doing the polling question, several people answered and said 812 APCs. Oh, thank you. We had you. a few other responses, but that got the most votes. Oh, perfect. And 15,035 CPT slash HICPIX got the most votes. We had a few other people respond with different numbers there as well. Oh, cool. Thank you so much. Then we had a question. Um, Page 77 says that electronic claims payment floor is 13 days, and page 104 says 14 days. Oh, you know wow. Wow. Correct? I think I think it is 13 days. Uh, but uh, let's do a quick chat on that uh, to check that out. I know you're answering a polling question right now. Yes. I think it's it's 13 days. Let's do 10 seconds more on the polling question. And I'm closing the polling question now. And there are the results. No, that is not the right answer. Um, uh, lab. Uh, usually is not bundled, but uh, it, like I a moment ago said, for uh, starting this year for visit codes, for visit codes only, lab is bundled. I didn't say that it's for visit codes. So, no A, uh, that was a relatively small number. Supplies uh, is the right answer. Uh, radiology is not bundled. Uh, radiology has. Uh, its own uh, APCs. By bundling, let's talk about what we mean by bundling. By bundling we mean packaging and by packaging or bundling we mean that they are not paid at all. Okay, that's what bundling or packaging here means. It doesn't mean multiple procedure discounting. Those are two, two different concepts. Okay, one more polling question and that is question number seven one that we haven't talked about, but uh, I think either you know the answer or you can reason yourself way to the right answer of this question by, by what, uh, what we talked about today. Christoph, this is Martha. Hi, Martha. Um, the question that I think the, the billing or the payment floor, the 14 days or 13 days, Yes. it's always been my knowledge that it's 14 days. Oh, thank you, Martha. Unless that's changed in the last couple of years, but I don't think it has. I think it's okay. 14 days. Thank you. Um, Christoph, we have one more comment regarding the composite APC codes that did not have the number of HIC fix listed beside of them on your table. Oh, yes. Thank you. And the person states that that is because for those codes you require multiple combinations of HIC fix, i.e. you need two or more codes to qualify for the APC. Oh, thank you so much. Wow, you see, I always learn something from from these classes, and thank you. I'm very grateful for this knowledge. Thank you also, Martha, and for the number of APCs and CPT codes, HICPIX codes. Okay, Let's so do what? Five more seconds on the polling yeah. question. And there are the results, Christoph. Yes. B is the right answer, and why is it the right answer? 
oh, okay, um, remember modifiers are only, are suffixes attached only to CPT or HICPIX codes. And IPPS does not use CPT or HICPIX codes. So A can't be the right answer. So uh, OPPS and Medicare Physician Fee Schedule both use uh, modifiers. Now we haven't talked about uh, uh, the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule, but uh, we will um, uh, either, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, um, my suggestion would be that you read on that yourselves and if you have any questions you send me an email. Uh, the one thing I do want to point out to you, uh, and then I will let you go, is this uh, page right here on relative value units. Okay, what goes into an RVU? There are three components of, of what goes into an RVU, and the magic words are here, right here. Time required, complexity, and training needed. Okay, that's what goes into a work RVU. Then there is a practice expense RVU and a malpractice RVU. We can read about each of them here. And then there is a conversion factor. We already talked about what that is and how little it is. And so here's the geodetic marker showing you what the number is that the entire MPFS system takes its bearing on. And here it is. And then here is how the update process works. There's a a geographic factor, it has a different name here, it's called a, a geographic practice uh, cost index. That's what, uh, so in other words, a doctor in one part of the country is necessarily paid the same as in another part of the country. The practice expense also is geographically updated and so is malpractice and malpractice in some parts of the country is significantly lower than in others and you see that here in an example for Mossy Green, for the doctor who treated the Joanna patient, Q patient in Mossy Green Hospital, that the Medicare, that the malpractice uh, indicator in Oregon is half the national average. The doctor gets paid the same as in other, any other place. The uh, practice costs a little less than the national average, but the malpractice is significantly lower in Oregon, say, than in Florida or New York or Chicago or bigger place. So here's an example of how the calculation works. Powerful tools and here since I showed you a UB04, I'm also showing you the associated claim form for the physician here which is a 1500 form and uh, we're going to have to leave it at that. Again, this is good information. If you don't do this every day, you can really learn and make up your deficit in knowledge by looking at this section in the book and at that I will leave you uh, and wish you a good rest of the week and uh, um, uh, wish you uh, the, the, the gift of some time this next week so that you can absorb this material and really learn it so that you don't have, a, you're not carrying over uh, in for, uh, uh, knowledge that you still have to gain into next week's webinar where we will cover uh, compliance, uh, managed care contracting and uh, disbursements uh, and then wrap up these uh, webinars. So thank you for your participation today, be well and uh, talk to you again next week. Thank you Christoph for your time. There was one question I didn't get a chance to get to okay. and that was involving the changes that were made on page 45 of the study guide that you mentioned to begin with. Yes. I would recommend that the person go out to the Tennessee website and, and review that and look for those changes. Right, um, and you and can print it out. And remind everyone yeah. that the materials will be posted by end of day tomorrow at tnhfm.org slash chfp hyphen webinars. Okay, Thank so you everyone for participating and have a great day.